Hi guys, it's Sophie. So I've made a booktube error of judgement and I didn't realise I'd made it until this morning. Um, I was just going to do a wrap up of the books I've read that were like non around the world, I hadn't spoken about yet, and went back to find my last wrap up and it was in May. So we've got a little bit of a pile of books to go through with you, I think there's like 30 odd. Um, but yeah, I'll kind of count them up and let you know at the end. Um, there's non-fiction, there's fiction, I'm just going to go, I think I'm going to start with fiction actually and then move on to non-fiction it's going to take as long as it takes this may just be a very long video so on the top of my pile i have the beautiful summer by cesare Pavese, and this is a really short little i think it's an italian novel um about a young woman who um is going through this very hot very stifling summer um, and falls in love with another woman um i really wanted to love this book and I really just didn't find it engaging at all. I didn't feel as though I connected at all with the characters or felt as though her lust or love or interest was real. It just felt very surface to me. Um, they, the women go to these artists and act as their models um, and it just felt, it all felt very shallow and empty to me. I just really didn't get on with it, which was um, a real shame as I, I thought this one was gonna be really good. Um, I think actually someone did recommend this one to me on, my LGBTQA plus um, recommendations uh, video, so I was kind of pretty hopeful from that because you guys are normally pretty good at like guessing what I like. Um, but this one just didn't just didn't click with me, unfortunately. Uh, I think I gave it about two stars. And next I have White Houses by Amy Bloom, um, and I spoke about this one in the same LGBTQIA recommendations. Um, and this is the story of uh, a woman called I think she's called Lenora. Lena. No, something like that. Lorena. Lorena Hitchcock, who falls in love with Eleanor Roosevelt and it's about their relationship and um, how that worked. So um, she's, Eleanor's married um, to the president at the time of this affair. Um, I did actually really enjoy this one. I, I normally am not a fan of kind of romance books, but this just felt so beautiful and well done that I just loved it and I think it wasn't... Um, everything's perfect romance which you guys know I have problems with it was kind of separations and falling in and out of love and old love and very mature love and yeah I just had a lot of time for it um I think I had known nothing about this before and wouldn't have thought I would necessarily be interested um but it's just a beautiful little story um it's got you know um kind of tight not not even ties to history like it kind of feels like it's mimicking the story of history but the author is very clear that she fictionalised a lot of it that's not supposed to be a non-fiction retelling of their lives and um, is a novel about their lives um, but it does feel real and connected with what really happened and yeah if you're interested um, do go and find that one. Next I have one that I read when I was in Turkey and that is Men the Living by Melissa Kerr and Gal. Um, I held off reading this one for ages and was sad that I hadn't had the the chance to get to it and just something wasn't clicking um, but when I picked it up I absolutely loved it, it's such a good book. Um, this is about uh, one man's heart in essence. Um, it's a boy um, whose name is Simon Limdu, Limbu, um, who dies very early on into the book in a car crash and his heart is what we follow so it's it's his heart from Simon's death. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's such a beautifully told story. Um, the writing and translation is fantastic. This um, is the same author who wrote The Bridge, which I really enjoyed as well. And she's just got such a fun way of playing with words and vocabulary. Um, and there's a, there was a really nice translator's note at the end, actually, sort of talking about um, this idea of one particular word um, that they're trying to get a hold of. And throughout the novel, she's kind of, the translator's kind of playing with how to get to this word and how to express what it really means in French and I love things like that when you have translators and um, pieces of work that are kind of definitely like trying so hard to give you the same experience as what you would have if you read it in the original or as sit as close as you can get obviously um, yeah I, I really love this book it really touched me and I read it really quickly as well I think um, I probably read it in like three or four hours um, but yeah really would recommend it the next one I have is one I read a little while ago, and that one is The Lover by Marguerite Duras. Um, this follows a woman who falls in love, a young French woman who falls in love with a Chinese man um, who is so sort of very rich and flashy, and it's about that affair in essence. Um, it 
was something I'd hoped to really love and didn't love it. Um, there were, the writing I did though, there were bits of the writing that were fabulous and I kind of underlined bits um, like there's one saying, all around her are wilderness wastes, the sun's a wilderness, the sun never do anything, um, or things like this, um, I don't know who took the photo with the despair, like just these kind of really striking little, little sections of writing, um, but I found the writing more intriguing than the plot, I think, and didn't connect with it in the way I'd hoped to. Um, I have got some really beautiful things underlined in here though, so I feel like I might go back and pick those things out and remind myself of those, um, you know, every now and again, but I just didn't, I didn't get it as a whole piece, and I think that's really frustrating because normally beautiful language draws me enough that I can be on board the whole way through, but I, I just didn't get it with the lover, unfortunately. The next one I have is Rachel Cusk's outline. Um, this is the first in a trilogy, um, all set around, um, I believe all set around one woman, um, who in this book is a creative writing teacher um, in Athens, teaching a workshop in English um, to kind of anyone who's interested. Um, and again, I felt quite strange about this book. I don't know that I disliked it. I think I kind of liked what it was, but it wasn't something that clicked with me immediately. Um, it's the writing, the book, the style is very much around these long conversations, these long stories. It's almost like, um, above all else, it's a collection of dialogues and conversations with interesting people. Um, sort of the first third of the book is about a conversation with a man on the plane. Um, and I think I have time for what it is, um, but I don't think it was something that I looked at and thought, wow, this is incredible. Um, I would actually want to read the rest of the trilogy, even having said that, because I think it's an interesting form and it's something I haven't really seen, like the idea of almost like tale telling is what it felt like, or kind of oral history of a character. And you feel as though the character herself is quite sparse and isolated because all you see her through is the conversations other people have with her um, but I think that was intended I think that was what this book is trying to do um, as I say I, I think I would be happy to read others um, but it wasn't a style that I just fell in love with um, but I'm intrigued I want to read more of it the next one I have is The People in the Trees by Hanye Angahara and I could talk about this one for hours <laughs> um, but I won't I'm going to try and keep it really short um, I absolutely loved this book. I loved A Little Life. I just love Hanya Angahari's writing. Um, this story is about a doctor who's a little bit of a kind of, um, I don't know, loose cannon, I suppose, and doesn't do things necessarily the way they should be done, but is um, very intelligent and can kind of get away with that waywardness. He teams up with an anthropologist to explore a remote island um, I think in Micronesia, um, where they've heard tales of a tribe that has never been contacted by anyone else, and there's a lot of myths and rumours around this tribe that uh, they don't die. Um, and we follow this doctor through his kind of early career and out to this island. Um, it's just so captivating throughout, um, and I felt as though I just couldn't look away from it. Um, there's this very beautiful, very ethereal sense of the forest and nature and this closeness to nature and then this really dark, horrible undertone um, of child sexual abuse. There's a lot of trigger warnings here, people said that and it's true. Um, there's uh, a need to examine the world through the eyes of a character that you might not necessarily find yourself wanting to be around, um, but I, I just absolutely loved that experience. Um, I didn't feel as though I kind of predicted everything that was going to happen and even though the kind of the, the kind of overlying story I did kind of guess what was going to happen because at the beginning you get told sort of how it turns out um, so you have a good idea of where you're trying to get to but I felt as though I was carried along in kind of the eddies of this story and I wanted to be with it. Um, I absolutely loved it. It's um, one that I would recommend, um, but be aware that for some people I expect reading in this character won't be your thing. Um, a bit like A Little Life, I think you have to decide whether or not that's something you can throw yourself into or whether you're like, I just don't want that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I get that, I get it either way, but I just, yeah, it was just such, such a good book. Um, and 
I think this was the one that, of all of the ones I read when I was away, that I just wanted to get back to constantly. I didn't want to not be reading it. Um, I remember sort of sitting in the sea thinking, oh, it's nice out here with all of the, you know, the sun and the waves, but I wish I was reading. Um, and yeah, just such, such a great book. Another one that I read when I was away was So Lucky by Nicola Griffith. Um, and this is a kind of short own voices novel about a woman who is in, I think her late 20s, early 30s, um, who's diagnosed with MS. She's also gay, so that's kind of, you, there's lots of representation here. Um, but the story is more about her MS and her coping with her MS than it is about her sexuality, I think, for me, which is cool. Um, and I'm so glad I read this. I think when it arrived, I was kind of like, mm, why did I want this? What drew me to it? And I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think someone on Instagram, someone on Twitter, someone had just spoken about it after they'd read it. And I thought that sounds like something I'd really enjoy. And I'm really glad um, that they did. Cause I think if I saw this, I wouldn't necessarily pick it up. Um, it's really about what illness takes away from people and what we don't let it take from us. Um, and who we are with illnesses and how that changes us. There's a lot of anger in here, a lot of really righteous anger and um, a sense of saying, actually, I'm not a victim, it's, I just have this thing. Um, but it's also kind of this, this really harrowing portrayal of what happens to someone when they have MS. And I've only ever really seen it like at a distance. Um, I had a friend whose dad had MS, but, and, and um, a, tutor that I had at university who I knew only peripherally but so the kind of experiences were, were further away from me and I don't think I ever saw the kind of intimate details um, of the illness whereas this is in the in the middle of it and I think because our um, protagonist is so isolated it, f it always fills up the whole screen maybe in a way that it might not if there was a big support network around um, the individual um, but yeah if you're looking for like own voices um, things around like MS or chronic illness or all the, any of those kind of things it's such a good one um, and it is a story it, it feels very closely autobiographical but it is a story and as you go toward the end of the book you kind of notice that more I think to start with it did feel as though I was just reading a memoir um, and it almost is something between memoir and novel and uh, yeah it's really good really good next one I have is Shirley Jackson's Hangers Man um, hangs a man, something like that. Uh, and this is a story about a young girl who goes to university and has sort of strange, unsettling things happening in her head. I thought that potentially it was some kind of mental health problem that she was having, or maybe it was just kind of a really overactive imagination. It's quite difficult to tell. Um, but it's really a story about someone going to university and losing themselves and kind of succumbing to the, the voices in your head almost. Um, I don't think that what the book is blurbed as or described as is what it is. Lots of people refer to the fact that this was inspired by a true story of a young girl who went to college and went missing. And I was expecting this to be the story of a girl who went missing. Um, and it isn't that. At no stage in the story for us is anybody missing. and. I think I, d I felt disappointed because I don't feel like this w this book gave me what I wanted it to, um, which is unfair because the reason I felt that way was because it, of the way it was kind of described, um, as opposed to it not being a good thing in its own right. Um, so it's kind of a mixed feeling of it. Um, I don't think I liked it as much as I liked um, The Lottery or the other Shirley Jackson I've read, Haunting in Hope Hill House, I think. Um, no, we've always lived in the castle. Um, I, so yeah, I like those much better than this. Um, but I felt as though this started on the back foot because it wasn't what it what it was in my head anyway, and that became clear just only really at the end. I was still waiting for this event to happen, and it never really does, um, which, as you can imagine, is just a bit frustrating. Um, but yeah, I think if you know what it is, you'll probably like it more. The next one I have is. The Fifth Child by Doris Lessing. Um, I read this one fairly closely with We Need to Talk About Kevin and I feel as though those books are very closely entwined alongside one I'm going to talk about next um, which is Sheila Hetty's Motherhood. Um, but focusing on The Fifth Child for a moment, um, this is a story of a couple who um, are kind of hanging on the edges of poverty. They have a very wealthy family network behind them but themselves they've kind of chosen a life in which Money doesn't really matter, um, 
partly because they have this safety net and they're always kind of running on the edge on donations from friends and family um, but build up a large family of children they have four children um, and are deciding whether to have a fifth and they kind of there's kind of this constant sense of expanse in this family that they're always going to be having more children their children are the thing that will make them happy um, but the fifth child that they have is called Ben and there's something not right with Ben um, and the mother knows this throughout the pregnancy that Ben is different and Ben isn't right um, and the story is really about Ben and about the relationship between Ben and his mother and his parents um, it's very dark and it's dark in a very different way to when you talk about Kevin um, I think I felt much less sympathy for the mother here and far more sympathy, sympathy for the child um, but sort of as you go toward the end, you do, it does feel, kind of feel quite confused that you're conflicted about um, whether this child is a bad thing or whether the children can even be bad things. Um, but whether, you know, there, there are some things that just happen to children that parents have no control over. It's, it's just a book looking at what do, we, what do we expect when we have children and what can the realities be? Um, and it, it is a really haunting little book. Um, and there's images in here that were just like holy shit and yeah really really strong really nasty little little pieces in here um i'm really glad i picked it up actually this is one that i found kind of on a whim i just went to the bookshop and thought i want more lady writers today and found this one and hadn't really read much doris lessing before i tried the, tried the golden notebook a little while ago and i just didn't get into it um but the fifth child has kind of reaffirmed me that i should read more of her because actually I, I, I love this and I think I might love The Golden Notebook if I read it today. I think maybe I read it a little bit too early. And then the next one I have is Motherhood by Sheila Hetty. Um, and just off the bat, I think this is probably my favourite book so far this year. Um, I will continue to talk about it in little bits and pieces. Um, but what I want to say about it here is that you should most definitely read it. Um, it is a book about the decision to have children or the not decision to have children or the way the world f turns out so that you do or don't have children. Um, there's a nice quote that I pulled out to talk about that um, which says a decision in the mind is pretty small it doesn't make babies but if a decision in the mind doesn't make babies why do I spend so much time thinking about it? We are judged by what happens to us as though our deciding made it happen um, and she is talking about what children are and what, what we make is and why we do it and why we don't. Um, she says, art is eternity backwards. Art is written for one's ancestors, even if those ancestors are elected, like our literary mothers and fathers are. We write for them and children are eternity forwards. It just, it talks about the difference between art and life in a weird way, um, but it is the most raw, most beautiful book about motherhood that in a weird way it's kind of anti-motherhood but it is motherhood that you could possibly have written or have in your hands um it just opened my mind up and let me think about some things I didn't even know I wanted to think about and I'm just so thankful for it I think it's such a fantastic book we're getting there with the fiction now the next one I have is I Love Dick by Chris Krause uh this is a really weird little book I think it's set in LA it feels like it's set in LA but I think it is, um, about a couple um, called, I think it's called Sylvain, um, and what's the lady called? Oh, Chris Krause, I knew that. Um, and they enter into this weird relationship with this professor called Dick. Um, and essentially Chris becomes obsessed with Dick in a sexual way, in an intellectual way, and starts this pseudo relationship with Dick through writing letters that he never really gets um, and it's, it turns into a project between the two, the couple, um, they think about making it into film, they think about all the things they can do with this with this really actually quite nasty obsession. Um, now Dick isn't like an innocent victim, Dick I think can be quite manipulative and quite nasty as well um, but it's just, it's just the obsession, stalking, creepy, horribleness let to run riot with someone else affirming that it's okay to do this. Um, it's the kind of thing that I would hope I would never do. Do you know what I mean? Like I think that's what I felt when I was doing. Like I hope there's never a situation that makes me feel that way. Um, 
yeah, and it's very self-referential. It relates to art and film a lot, um, as well as kind of some intellectual chat as well, which I think is which I think is great. Uh, and I would want to read more Chris Krauss, despite this being quite an uncomfortable reading experience for me. Um, I think that is probably good. Um, and yeah, it was not what I expected. It's kind of again like that mix of fiction, memoir. Is it real? Is it not real? Um, which is why I should have known about the self-referential character name. Um, and I like that. I like the idea of mixing that that genre, as dangerous as it is, especially when you're talking about obsession and a person who could be like an identifiable actual human being. Um, yeah, it was more, much more than I expected it to be. We are getting there with fiction now. I think I've probably got about eight books of fiction left to go. Um, so the next one I wanted to have a quick chat about was Crudo by Olivia Lang, um, which I got as a proof copy um, because I um, have read Olivia Lang's non-fiction and I've enjoyed it before and because Simon from Savage Reads had such a fantastic review of this one I wanted to check it out. Um, this is a book about the summer of 2017 in which Brexit happened and Trump happened and what what happened when the world set on fire essentially. Um, yeah, it, it's one woman's summer, she's in her 40s um, and she's just kind of watching this world unfold and the, uh, the political events have folded into her everyday life. Olivia Lang said that she wrote this book in almost like a a torrent of just get it out and it's been very minimally edited since and I actually really got on with that. Um, it did feel as though the world was happening to this woman rather than it being a book that was self-consciously writing about political events which I, which I really did enjoy. Um, I think I liked it more having thought about it afterwards than I did reading it. Um, I think reading it I had the same sense I have with Olivia Lang's non-fiction which is I very much liked the idea but I think it didn't quite work the way I wanted it to. Um, but after the fact I feel like I've enjoyed Crudo more. It is the best book on that Brexit Trump scenario that I have read or like um, heard about as well. Um, I think, I don't think there's anything else that's like in that period that really struck me. Like I've read Ali Smith's Autumn and I, I get that feeling too, but I think this one actually does it much better. Um, so if you're interested in that, if you haven't read Olivia Lang at all, I would recommend The Lonely City by her as the first one, which is a non-fiction book about New York and art. And the next one I have to talk about is The Crane's Dance by Meg Harry, um, which again was one I had on my TBR for a really long time and I thought about giving away and I loved it, I think I gave this five stars in the end. It just took me a while to get to it. Uh, this is a story of two sisters who are professional ballerinas. One of the sisters um, is out of the picture, but we hear about her kind of by her shadow all of the time. Um, she's had some kind of nervous breakdown and has hurt herself in such a way that she cannot dance. Her sister, who is the inferior of the two ballet dancers, but the eldest sister and kind of went before is still out in the world and is kind of always comparing herself to her sister and also this kind of hypothetical perfection of ballet. I think it was such a good book about ballet. Um, I can't dance, <laughs> never will be able to dance, um, but I think ballet is just the most gorgeous thing. I've never been to an actual ballet and I need to go, but when I was younger I used to like obsessively watch all the ballet films I could get my hands on. Um, I didn't read any books really about ballet, well I read a few that were kind of anorexia memoirs. Um, but I hadn't read any that were like specifically about the ballet rather than the psycho psychological effects of ballet. Um, and it was just really good. It was just, it just absolutely brought you along with it. Um, and I think I found just the very beginning a little bit difficult because it felt a little bit patronizing. It's just explaining Swan Lake in, in, and in small details so that you'll understand what the, you know, what, what it is, what the ballet is. Um, but it feels like you're being spoken down to and I think opening the book for that I was like oh god am I going to be told off for not being really into ballet and not be able to enjoy it and I think that put me off but once I got past that little bit I absolutely loved it. Um, I want to read more about it now like if you have any recommendations for other ballet books in New York I would very much like to read them. The next one which I didn't get on with particularly um, but that I think I remember for quite a long time is Death in Spring by Mercy Rodivera. Um, this is a book that is set in Catalan in a strange little village um, set underneath this hill where this uh, kind of patriarchal um, elder lives, um, kind of covered in this ivy, in this kind of ivy clad tower apart from everyone else. Um, 
the village itself has really strange customs and um, pieces and you never really know quite what they are until they're explained later on and I feel as though it's a little bit of a spoiler to go through any of them properly um, but there's one um, that we learn about quite early on about them, that the men have to dive into the river and they're kind of taken by the river and often they lose their faces and we have all these faceless men walking around. The whole story is really uh, like a metaphor um, for what happens if a country is kind of taken over by fascism and um, the kind of death and horror and things that, that happen after that but it's all told in a way that it is a real village that does these strange things and I think that's quite intriguing to read about um, but it's bits of it were just so violent and so I normally write with quite dark stuff I think it just it just felt unbearable how dark it was and I, I just didn't really want to be reading it um, I read it quite quickly I read it um, in a couple of afternoons and I think I needed to because it just felt like there was so much there that was unsettling and not really what I wanted from it um, I think um, but I will definitely remember it it reminded me a little bit um, of Twilight by Ellie Wiesel in a weird way um, that's really the book I compare it to you most um, I maybe think it's worth reading I just it just was too much for me and little is so maybe it's quite quite an out there one um, but I learned something from it and I feel like I will remember it for a really long time. The next one I have is Northwood by Maris Mayher. Um, this is an advanced reading copy. It actually isn't on sale until November, so there is a little bit of time for this one. But I'm so glad I got sent this one um, because a short story collection by her was one of my best books of, I think, 2016, and this is her first novel. Um, it is a novel in verse, a novel in kind of sections of proper poetry, kind of prose poetry. Um, and it all kind of pulls together and I've been, I've been reading a few of these recently these prose poem things and I think I actually quite like them I think I'm, I was a little bit unsure to begin with I didn't really know how to grasp it or what bits to hold on to um, but I think actually I just had to let myself go and let it happen um, it's a story of a really abusive relationship that a woman has and the after effects of that relationship um, she runs away to be alone in the woods to try and paint and get out of her own head and change her life in some way and immediately, nearly immediately meets this man who is just the biggest dickhead to her um, but that she loves and that she never really stops loving even when she knows what he's done is wrong um, and I just really related to that and how his impact flooded through all of these other relationships she had. Um, I think it's a really important book like about that, about like how abusive relationships start and what they look like and then what happens afterwards um, and I haven't read anything else that deals with it like that. Um, it does have a lot of kind of allegory for fairy tales as well and I'm not as into fairy tales as a lot of other people I know on booktube are, or like booktube watchers are, so I think I miss a lot of references which was a bit of a shame um, but I imagine if you're into fairy tales you might enjoy that aspect more as well. Um, I really would recommend it, I really enjoyed it and yeah I'll read it again because it was a very very quick read, I read it in like two or three hours I reckon um, just because there's because it's like a fairly narrow one and there's quite a lot of blank space on each page you can kind of see that, um, you'll, you'll fly through it but yeah I really did enjoy it. The next one I have is one that I was actually really disappointed wasn't on the man booker this year um, and that one is The Shepherd's Hut by Tim Winton um, reading this I could see it there <laughs> like when I was reading it I was like this feels so much like a prize book it feels like a man booker book um, it is a book about a young guy in Australia who has this, has this really shitty life has this dickhead father his dad is just such an arsehole and is always drunk and manages to die he's trying to fix his car he's jacked it up like on the rhubarb of his car and it falls and it, it breaks his skull now the boy knows that he's basically the only person anyone would assume would hurt this man um, and realises that he can't stay at home. People are just going to assume he's murdered his dad because they know how much of a twat he is to him. So he just decides to like vanish into the bush basically. And we follow him trying to get away and deal with himself and the situation. And it's just, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it felt, I think because I didn't read so much Australian stuff, it felt really fresh and new as well. Um, but it is, it's absolutely like a pacey book, the writing is very clear, I think that's what I had about the Mum Booker elements of it, was it felt very clear that the sentences were all necessary um, and that it told a really good story. So if, you, if you're interested in that at all, I would really recommend it. Um, I found it really heartbreaking actually, I found it really sad to read in parts 
um, and I did feel as though I was kind of connected. I fe it felt very there, I felt very connected with this character and the world. The next one I have is A Close Call for one of my favourite books of the year. I, this, might, this probably is going to be my top five. This is My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Tessa Moshveg, who wrote Eileen. Again, I could just do a whole video talking about this book. It's about a lady who has a life and isn't very happy with it, so decides she'd be better off asleep for a year, in essence. And she gets prescribed these fucking heavy duty drugs to keep her in this comatose state for this year. Um, we follow her as she's kind of drifting in and out of sleep. So we are with her, we are just watching someone sleep. She, she has to wake up every now and again and then is kind of dragging herself back down. Um, oh, it's just so good. It's kind of like, partly it satisfies that, that craving that people have when they've had mental illness or, or long-term conditions to just stop for a minute, to just say, no, fuck off, just fuck off, let me sleep. Um, but it's also looking at like why that is can't happen, like why we can't just shut ourselves away from the world and pretend it's not there um, for like longer than a day, do you know what I mean? It just doesn't work. It just watching her psyche just slowly kind of disintegrate and seeing the the complicity of the doctors in this, it's so good, it's so good. It's talking about mental illness, the experience of being like on meds on mental illness. Um, oh, it's it's cold and funny and relatable and there's the characters are just fantastic there's um the on, on again off again boyfriend who feels real and you just want to strangle him and the, and the friend that she hates but is her only contact um really with the whole world it's just fabulous just go and read this book i loved it so much now i'm actually going to stop at the end of fiction because i've been recording for like 40 minutes um so i've just got two more to talk about and then i'll put a break here and then the next video will be non-fiction um so the second to last one i have is love in the time of cholera by gabriela garcia marquez um this one i read for my in real life book club and it is kind of a modern classic um i've never read anything um from the author before um, I was excited because it felt like a, you know, a big name that I'd never gotten to. Um, I know that he's famous for his kind of like magical realism, um, but this isn't a magical realism book at all. It, it's kind of a straight romance um, story, what kind of unrequited love story. Um, but just, it was just absurd and strange and over the top, and very flamboyant. Um, and I did really enjoy it. I think um, all of it felt a bit too much, all of it felt a bit too big for kind of the thing that it was contained within, but I enjoyed that as a reading experience. I enjoyed this kind of heightened emotions, heightened states, silly things that I don't think would really happen in real life, but that in this world totally made sense. Um, I, I was really surprised by this, I thought I was going to hate it, so yeah, if it's not your kind of thing, if it's not your kind of thing normally, you might actually like it. I was surprised by how with it I was um, as I read it and I wouldn't have read it at all if I hadn't been for book club um, so yeah it's one of the exciting things that book club, books clubs can do is like drag you to stuff you wouldn't have read otherwise and then the very last one I have for fiction is Pages for You by Sylvia Brownrigg uh, which is a lovely little book and as well there's a second one called Pages for Her that I need to read I thought I'm done with it I like this as it was but I kind of want a bit more um, this is a story about a young university student who goes away from home for the first time and falls in love with her professor um, and it's all told um, in these kind of conversations after the fact, after the relationship has ended, we know that it doesn't work out, um, we don't know how um, and we don't really know how these people interact with each other or for how long, um, but it is just, I <laughs> hello Foz, it is just such a heartwarming and heartbreaking story all wrapped up in one um, and it was just nice to read it and feel that world and feel that relationship and the complexities of it and it not kind of being fetishized or overly romanticized and yeah it was just it was just really good um, I, th I know lots of people have an issue with the uh, sort of naive younger person is brought into the gay world by a you know older lady who knows all the ropes or whatever um, but I think I relate to that because the first female female relationship I ever had was with a much older woman and it feels like nostalgia for me um, and I actually didn't think it was that bad of an experience to have um, that's not saying it isn't for everyone I know that that can be a really manipulative and unpleasant and unhealthy place to be in um, 
but I think you know if everyone's grown up, if everyone's an adult, then I'm kind of I'm kind of fine with it. Do do as you will. I think if you're above eighteen, um, yeah. I just I I just really liked it. I really enjoyed the little story of it, and I yeah. I just want to read it again. So I think I need to read pages for her because that is kind of the same story but from the other perspective. This is told from the younger partner's um, perspective and her kind of idealistic, naive love. Um, yeah, so that is the last fiction that I have. This has been a long old video. Um, I, I was going to film the non-fiction straight away, but I'm, I'm kind of done. I've been talking for 40 minutes straight, so I'm actually going to uh, come back another day and film the non-fiction. Um, I have a couple of my booker reviews to give to you guys as well. I've got one that's, up, one that's uploading or is edited that needs to go up still. Two more to film, so I'm doing pretty well. I think I've read five, maybe six so far. But yeah, so hopefully that's been enjoyable. I'm sorry it was so long. I just completely forgot. I'll try and do the monthly from here on if I if I can or if I need to, maybe twice monthly. But I should just not forget for like four months or three months or however long it's been. Um, yeah, I'll chat to you guys soon. I'm gonna just pay some attention to this cat because she's being such a sweetheart, aren't you, baby? She's properly coming up for cuddles and purring. Um, so yeah, I will chat to you guys soon and look after yourselves until then. Bye bye. Hi.